what you're gonna do. You can't fight the future. Wrestling God. ProWrestlingRadio.com presents. Are you talking to me? Pro Wrestling Radio. Live. Online. You think The Rock actually cares? What is he doing here? Oh, it's true. I'm bringing everybody with me. The Rock That's hard time. To be the man. Call in with a question or comment. Six. One. Can you feel it? I hate your ever. Hold oh, the damn soul. Call three. At 1-877-800-8834. That's how I roll! You're sex at Come get some! Because I've done all of that! And now your host of the show. The king is back on his throne. Eric. Excuse me! Gargiulo. And that's the bottom line, because Stone Cold sets up. All righty, welcome to another edition of Pro Wrestling Radio. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome a guest that I am extremely excited about. He is a former World Heavyweight Champion and one of my all-time favorite wrestlers. He is Rob Van Dam. Rob, welcome to the program. Thanks, dude. Glad to be here. Good thing I brought my belt. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I guess an appropriate first question for uh, the fans out there that haven't seen you since you were wrestling full-time in the WWE. Maybe you can update uh, all your good fans out there and let them know what you've been up to. Yeah. Um, well, the short answer is watch RVD TV. And uh, the reason I say that is not only to plug the reality show that I have at RobVanDam.com, but also, uh, truthfully, I've been uh, filming um, almost consistently uh, for for most of the last two years uh, that I've been away from WWE. I just bring the camera with me everywhere uh, for the most part. And um, I got burnt out, tired of the travel, uh, every everything that comes with being burnt out. I got tired of the job, the same monotonous. I wanted to uh, do other things and did not have the energy or time or uh, any of the resources to do anything except just uh, make that next town day after day after day. Uh, so when I chose not to re-sign, uh, I was so burnt out. I really didn't care if I ever wrestled again. I didn't care if I ever set, uh, stepped on an airplane again. Yeah. I was so burnt out. I really, really loved California. And uh, that, for the most part, that remains true. I um, still love California. It's still very, very hard to get me away from my home. Um <laughs> The uh, thing that changed with wrestling was just that I was uh, enticed, uh, I don't know, six, seven months into my break, I was enticed to go to Portugal because uh, they approached me uh, by going after SVD. <laughs> they said, we'll fly you and your wife, business class, um, you know, it's a great place to have a vacation, we'll uh, put you up in a hotel for a few extra days, and Sonia said, ooh, Portugal, let's go. The money in the bank up front, that started some standards that I've used uh, since then. So I've wrestled uh, for this uh, NWE group in Spain, although they sometimes falsely advertise that I'm going to be in towns that I'm not in. Uh -huh. Now I'm wrestling for the AWR, which is out of Ireland, and they wrestle in uh, France, uh, Germany, Romania, maybe Poland soon. Uh, we just got back from uh, Switzerland uh, and France recently. So those are my standards. I wrestle internationally for the promoters that can meet my diva-like demands <laughs> and put the, put the cash in the bank up front, fly my wife and I, uh, business class. And it's a totally different experience then. It's like, it's not like uh, being one of the cattle, um, you know, being led town to town. It's really, you know, like VIP treatment the whole way. And it's enjoyable. So I do that. And also career-wise, uh, I'm getting into the action movie scene, which I'm having a blast at. Cool. This project has been on the table for a long time, four or five years anyway. Just finished filming Wrong Side of Town. I'm a star. It was written uh, and developed for me by somebody that I know really well. Okay. So uh, I don't have to really stretch that, that much to play the part. Batista has a huge role in it. Viscera is in it. Stormy Daniels from Wicked Pictures. Ja Rule, Omarion. So we got some really good people from uh, different fields of entertainment that should bring a lot of cross interest to it. And um, of course, I had uh, I had the video camera. Um, RVD TV is there uh, the whole time, behind the scenes, talking to the actors and uh, 
even showing footage that I'm not supposed to show of, uh, of the <laughs> set. And, <laughs> but but uh, anyway, um, had a blast, and uh, I got more to, more on the on the on the table, more action movies on the table, three more uh, in the franchise of Rock Side of Town, and then um, other projects too. So pretty excited with that. You know, career wise, everything's been been going really great. If uh, the big biggest thing that has impacted my life uh, since leaving WWE is that my wife had to go through a battle with cancer, which if somebody uh, doesn't know that, uh, that was a pretty, pretty, like a best way to say, you know, impactful thing to happen there. She, we had no idea. It came out of nowhere. Now she's doing great. She's had the surgery. She's done the chemo. She's had the, uh, the clean testing afterwards. She's good. She's healthy. She loves life. And uh, we're both very grateful. That is fantastic. And, you know, since, since you brought up uh, your wonderful wife, uh, you know, something I wanted to talk about was how public um, you have gone with her battle with cancer. And, uh, you know, for me, I lost my father to cancer, so it's something that's very near and dear to me. And I think what you're doing is, is fantastic. And I think, what, what you're, you know, it takes somebody like yourself to put a face on it for wrestling fans. And, you know, was this something that you and your wife consciously talked about, or was it just an outlet for you once you heard the news? How did that come about? Well, basically, it was totally her decision. It was one of the first things out of her mouth. We never expected the, the results, and that never even crossed my mind. Yeah. I thought we were dealing with an ulcer, something like that. And when we found out that at 33 years old, a 105-pound, very healthy girl that doesn't hardly even eat red meat could be diagnosed with colon cancer, uh, it was almost immediately she said, we got to let everyone know. We got to tell them because the doctors don't want to do the testing. They they do like a couple of levels of testing, and they don't want to do the colonoscopy because it's not standard until you're like 50 or something. But yeah. as we found out the hard way, and a lot of people we've talked to since then, uh, if you're having problems like abdominal cramps, you know you got to get that shit taken care of, and uh, that's uh, that's something that um, the doctors aren't always going to point you in the right direction. I said it's like a full. 12 months before we found out what it really was, all that time it was developing and working against us. Um, and that's because, like I said, you know, they only go through certain levels of, of, uh, of testing based on, you know, what the insurance companies will pay and also, you know, based on uh, statistics. But yeah. So uh, she said, boom, you know, let's, let's let everybody know uh, because we could be saving lives. Yeah. Have you been um, surprised at the, the outpouring of public support that you've gotten since you went public with it? It's been crazy. Uh, it, it's been, uh, you know, I mean, I know that I knew I would have support from the fans because, you know, my, my fans are the best, and uh, I know that. Um, what really surprised me was how much everybody could relate to this because, as I said, the thought never even crossed my mind. I didn't know it could happen to me or somebody even in my, in my life, and, and what I found since this happened is that it's incredibly common uh, in fact, it's like one out of every, um, I forget if it's men or women that have the greater odds, but it's mm -hmm. like I think one out of every uh, two women and one out of every three men uh, will get cancer in their lifetime. And that's like, that's everybody or, you know, that's us or somebody that, that we know. It's incredibly common. Everybody had their own stories to share with uh you know, their dealings, uh, both good and bad. And, you know, when I say good, I don't mean it was a real good time. I just mean that a lot of people, you know, were able to uh, uh, make it through and stay positive and actually make a change in their life for the better uh, from it. Yeah. You know, uh, Sonia being treated at the City of Hope, which is a huge cancer research center, she's now joined the advisory board for patients, and, and she's helping them... Uh, with uh, fundraising activities and uh, with uh, sponsors, and she's jamming. So she really, she really did a good thing by going through there. She's making the experience better for other patients that will follow through what she had to go through. Yeah, and and again, we're we're talking to Rob Van Dam, and and Rob, you know, speaking of your wrestling career, I, I want to go back to the beginning when you uh, trained under the Sheik and. You know, as an old-school wrestling fan like myself, I mean, guys like the Sheik just, just fascinate me. Uh, what was it like when you first met the Sheik? And, you know, at, at one point did he kind of pull the veil off, so to speak, on the wrestling business? Um, if I understand the question right, um, which I'm not sure if I do, if you're asking, you know, like when he, when he opened up to yes. train me, he, yeah. he never did. 
Oh, okay. I thought he never you... did. You, you would think I'm exaggerating uh, by my by my story, but it's uh, it, it, it's very true. He never uh, smartened us up. We uh, he never one time while training us ever told us like uh, like this is the right way to fall or uh, or you know this is how to how to pull off uh, you know. Uh, getting these moves and, and, and planning it, you know, never about talking to each other, uh, nothing like that, uh, ever, ever. It was like we kind of knew that when we were in there that we were working together to an extent and we didn't want to kill each other, yeah. but he never, ever said anything. And if he even caught us, you know, trying to, like, talk to each other, what are you talking about? You know, what are you talking about? You know, what are you going to talk to him? You know, pit him. And uh, that's, that's the way that we learned. Yeah, Wow. Um, you know, over the years that, that I've been doing the radio show here, and I'm sure you hear it everywhere you go, um, you know, the frustration from the old school ECW fans that watch today's current product or even the beginning of the, uh, the metamorphosis into the WWE ECW. And for somebody like yourself that was so passionate about ECW um, back in, in your, your day there, was it frustrating for you to see the change and, and, and once Vince brought it back and to see where it was going to go? Um, yeah, it was extremely frustrated when I was caught uh, there in the middle of it. It was something that I really cared a lot about, and it was like a bait and switch. I mean, he had me and everybody thinking we were bringing ECW back. The uh, One Night Stand pay-per-view when I wrestled Cena, the ECW versus SmackDown special uh, that followed, that was all, um, you know, that was all like original ECW. ECW meant anything goes. And then as soon as they changed that, and he said it didn't mean anything goes anymore, um, then, yeah, I started getting very frustrated. And, uh, I mean, there was, a, there was a point when I just totally gave up, and that was when Vince told me that he didn't want this to be anything like the old ECW. He didn't think anybody remembered the old ECW. It was something totally different, totally new. Uh, and at that point, I knew that, you know, I really didn't have much passion for it. Will you be taking part in any of the uh, upcoming ECW reunion shows? I don't have anything. Uh, I'm not scheduled or booked to be uh, at any of them, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, so, some people, I have a chat room going uh, while we have the radio show on here, and there are some fans in the chat room that aren't familiar with RVD TV, and they're asking what it is. So, you know, feel free to, uh, to hype it up and, and talk about it a little bit if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at robbrandam.com, I have this uh, reality show, RVD TV, and it's uh, a new episode every week, and then the episodes go into the archives, so they stick around. There's like 75 episodes uh, that members can look at, and it's it's actual, uh, it's reality. It's not like contrived reality, like when you watch reality on VH1 and, and people get together and pretend that they're spontaneously coming up with ideas, you know, like, hey, let's all get together and, and go to SeaWorld <laughs> today. Okay, I'll get the truck. It's not like that at all. It's actually turning the camera on uh, while me and my friends are, are doing stuff. You know, sometimes it's me by myself. Sometimes I'm working out in the gym, instructional workouts. Uh, I get together with my celebrity friends, friends that are related to the entertainment industry, whether they're comedians or actors or wrestlers, whatever, and we talk about social issues because uh, this is the real me, and it's something that I show is the real side uh, of these people uh, on common ground. So, for instance, myself and Warrior in the Winsky, uh, we all talk about brain control, uh, the power of the mind, you know, what you can really overcome with your mind, you know, especially in perspectives of addiction uh, and, and goals and stuff like that. And it's, it's something that the RVD that you see in WWE or ECW uh, would not be the first one on RVD TV. This is the real me that you're talking. Um, and I have conversations. Uh, I get together with my friends. I call it Friends in High Places. It's a very current segment. Uh, I get together with uh, Dustin McCauley, Master, and uh, Chris Masters. I uh, will talk about gun control. You know, and we'll talk about anything. We'll talk about a death penalty. we we'll talk about language censorship. Um, it's something I've always enjoyed doing. So I put the camera on and I record these and uh, I make a new episode. You know? So it keeps me busy, basically. Right now is 
the uh, membership prices on the website because you have to pay for the production at this point. Sure. It's like uh, it's like five ninety five a, a month, which uh, it's been it's been lowered so more people can get it. And everybody that joins gets a free DVD. There's a one disc only available at the website that Big Vision Entertainment will send you. So you can uh, you can buy the disc, or for five ninety five you get a membership and you get a free DVD, uh, which which is a pretty cool DVD. It's Volume One RVD TV DVD Volume One, and um, Big Vision Entertainment will send that to you if you join at robvandam.com. And you can quit anytime you want to, but uh, most of our members are really uh, happy. They leave, they send me emails and messages, and they, they've been uh, supporting it for um, like a year and a half now. And yeah. I don't know how long I'll do it. You know, it's, uh, it's just something that I do because I can. And I've had a lot of uh, guest cameos from some uh, really important people, and uh, that's cool. And it's an outlet. It's an outlet for me to uh, talk about stuff. Uh, like I said, I had it behind the uh, behind the scenes there for Wrong Side of Town. I had it in my trailer. I got some <laughs> of the other actors in there, and I'm interviewing them, and uh, we're setting up scenes. And uh, it's just it's pretty much always there. I've had the RVD TV camera internationally. I've had it um, on my overseas trips that uh, I've done recently in uh, France and Switzerland, and also in, in Spain and uh, Japan and. Um, it's just kind of always there, so people that want to know what I've been doing, uh, check it out. There's a, a click on previews on robvandam.com. It'll take you to the YouTube page where there's like uh, tons. There's over 70 different uh, episode previews, and you'll totally, totally get what we're doing right off the bat. Yeah, there's a real fun uh, video there of you uh, imitating the Ultimate Warrior that I was checking out. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that leads to one of my questions because, you know, I've been doing my radio show here for over 10 years. And, you know, Warrior has this reputation. A lot of the guys have come on the show and they haven't had good things to say about him. And you seem, you know, for, from over the years, you seem like a pretty straight up dude. And, uh, you know, you worked with him. You trained with him uh, when he was coming back to the ring. What was the impression that he left on you? You know, I can only speak firsthand, and we got along really well. I'm not sure uh, if that means that, uh, that I'm a nut, too, but, you know, <laughs> most of my friends are crazy. I can't believe I'm the only one that's not. Um, I totally expected to have some warrior moments. <laughs> I had uh, picked him up from the airport. We shot some RVD TV with Chris Nowinski, and I we went to the wrestling uh, gym and, and worked out. And the entire time, he was nothing but respectful. And at the end of the day, he said, "You know what, Rob?" He said, "I just really feel like we connected." He goes, "I'm going to put uh, I'm going to put a, a banner up on my website that says to go to your website." Like, I've never done that for anybody in ten years. I'm going to do that for you. And I don't know if he did that or not, yeah. but I was just like, "Wow, man, that was that was like really cool." And um, I had a total different experience with him than, than a lot of people will. That's awesome. And an another name that you brought up, uh, I have some people in the chat room asking me to ask you about Chris Masters, if you've heard anything about him uh, coming back to the WWE. Yeah, I mean, at this point, there's no uh, official word. He, it's best, best as I understand, I don't think he's uh, officially signed anything yet, you know, so... Um, you know, so there's really no no word there, but I, you know, he's uh, he's ready. He's in great shape, and uh, he's he's off the stuff that got him in trouble last time, uh, and he's really motivated. And now he's got more experience because he's been doing the indie scene. Guys just skip the indie scene and go straight from rest of the school to the big time, and they're still uh, on the job training. You know, learning uh, while everyone's working around them. They don't really understand uh, a lot of the uh, intimate connection you have working the indie shows, and that gives you a lot of control, uh, and you need that for your foundation. You know, yeah. So he's definitely more well-rounded now. We'll see what happens. Yeah, what, uh, what are your memories on uh, the late Misawa? I mean, you, you spent a great deal of your time earlier in your career in All Japan. Masawa was the only cool Japanese veteran to us Americans. Uh, when I started wrestling in all Japan in 93, uh, Kawada and uh, all the other guys, they were all like real jerks to us. And that's part of their culture, you know, that's what they do. We're, especially me, I was a young boy, and some of the other guys that were young boys, you know, they, they kind of, they, they, looked, they looked down on us, and they made it well known that they looked down on us. They wouldn't talk to us, you know, they kind of like snarl at us. Yeah. But Sawa was the only one that was cool. Uh, as over as he was, like, top guy. I mean, the crowd would go nuts when he would come out. He was still humble enough. 
he would even come to our dressing room uh, to talk to us uh, on, the, on the American side sometimes. It's the other Japanese guys. Never, never. Wow. Not once they reach a certain uh, stage. You know, the young boys would come over. And also, it, it, it's very true, he never, uh, come on, this up, we, uh, he never one time while training us ever told us, like, uh, like this is the right way to fall or, uh, or you know, this is how to, how to pull off, uh, you know, uh, getting these moves and, and, and planning it. You know, never about talking to each other. Uh, nothing like that uh, ever, ever. It was like we kind of knew that when we were in there, that we were working together to an extent and we didn't want to kill each other. Yeah. But he never, ever said anything. And if he even caught us, you know, trying to, like, talk to each other, what are you talking about? You know, what are you talking about? You know, what are you going to talk to him? You know, pin him. And uh, that's, that's the way that we learned. Yeah, wow. Um, you know, over the years that, that I've been doing the radio show here, and I'm sure you hear it everywhere you go, um, you know, the frustration from the old school ECW fans that watch today's current product or even the beginning of the, uh, the metamorphosis into the WWE ECW. And for somebody like yourself that was so passionate about ECW um, back in, in your, your day there, was it frustrating for you to see the change and, and, and once Vince brought it back and to see where it was going to go? Um, yeah, it was extremely frustrated when I was caught uh, there in the middle of it. It was something that I really cared a lot about, and it was like a bait and switch. I mean, he had me and everybody thinking we were bringing ECW back. The uh, one night stand pay per view when I wrestled Cena, the ECW versus SmackDown special uh, that followed. That was all, um, you know, that was all like original ECW. ECW meant anything goes. And then as soon as they changed that, and he said it didn't mean anything goes anymore, um, then, yeah, I started getting very frustrated. And, uh, I mean, there was, a, there was a point when I just totally gave up, and that was when Vince told me that he didn't want this to be anything like the old ECW. He didn't think anybody remembered the old ECW. It was something totally different, totally new. Uh, and at that point, I knew that, you know, I really didn't have much passion for it. Will you be taking part in any of the uh, upcoming ECW reunion shows? I don't have anything. Uh, I'm not scheduled or booked to be uh, at any of them, no. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, so, some people, I have a chat room going uh, while we have the radio show on here, and there are some fans in the chat room that aren't familiar with RVD TV, and they're asking what it is. So, you know, feel free to, uh, to hype it up and, and talk about it a little bit if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, at robbrandam.com, I have this uh, reality show, RVD TV, and it's uh, a new episode every week, and then the episodes go into the archives, so they stick around. There's like 75 episodes uh, that members can look at, and it's, it's actual, uh, it's reality. It's not like contrived reality, like when you watch reality on VH1 and, and people get together and pretend that they're spontaneously coming up with ideas, you know, like, hey, let's all get together and, and go to SeaWorld <laughs> today. Okay, I'll get the truck. It's not like that at all. It's actually turning the camera on uh, while me and my friends are, are doing stuff. You know, sometimes it's me by myself. Sometimes I'm working out in the gym, instructional workouts. Uh, I get together with my celebrity friends, friends that are related to the entertainment industry, whether they're comedians or actors or wrestlers, whatever, and we talk about social issues because uh, this is the real me and it's something that I show is the real side uh, of these people uh, on common ground. So, for instance, myself and Warrior in the Winsky, uh, we all talk about brain control, uh, the power of the mind, you know, what you can really overcome with your mind, you know, especially in perspectives of addiction uh, and, and goals and stuff like that. And it's, it's something that the RVD that you see in WWE or ECW uh, would not be the first one on RVD TV. This is the real me that you're talking. Um, and I have conversations. Uh, I get together with my friends. I call it Friends in High Places. It's a recurring segment. Uh, I get together with uh, Dustin McCauley, Master, and uh, Chris Masters. I uh, will talk about gun control. You know, and we'll talk about anything. We'll talk about a death penalty. we we'll talk about language censorship. Um, it's something I've always enjoyed doing. So I put the camera on and I record these and uh, I make a new episode. You know? So it keeps me busy, basically. We have to have a new episode every week, and now the first DVD is out of the original entertainment at the cheapest set that's uh, available very much that I have in the stores right now. And I have like 10 or 12 episodes of the magazine or stories and stuff. And uh, what 
thing that is really crazy right now is the uh, membership prices on the website because you have to pay for the production at this point. Sure. It's like uh, it's like five ninety five a, a month, which uh, it's been it's been lowered so more people can get it. And everybody that joins gets a free DVD. There's a one disc only available at the website that Big Vision Entertainment will send you. So you can uh, you can buy the disc, or for five ninety five you get a membership and you get a free DVD, uh, which which is a pretty cool DVD. It's Volume One RVD TV DVD Volume One, and um, Big Vision Entertainment will send that to you if you join at robvandam.com. And you can quit anytime you want to, but uh, most of our members are really uh, happy. They leave, they send me emails and messages, and they've been uh, supporting it for um, like a year and a half now. And yeah. I don't know how long I'll do it. You know, it's, uh, it's just something that I do because I can. And I've had a lot of uh, guest cameos from some uh, really important people, and uh, that's cool. And it's an outlet. It's an outlet for me to uh, talk about stuff. Uh, like I said, I had it behind the uh, behind the scenes there for Wrong Side of Town. I had it in my trailer. I got some <laughs> of the other actors in there, and I'm interviewing them, and uh, we're setting up scenes. And uh, it's just it's pretty much always there. I've had the RVD TV camera internationally. I've had it um, on my overseas trips that uh, I've done recently in uh, France and Switzerland, and also in, in Spain and uh, Japan and. Um, it's just kind of always there. So people that want to know what I've been doing, uh, check it out. There's a, a click on previews on robvandam.com. It'll take you to the YouTube page where there's like uh, tons. There's over 70 different uh, episode previews, and you'll totally, totally get what we're doing right off the bat. Yeah, there's a real fun uh, video there of you uh, imitating the Ultimate Warrior that I was checking out. And, uh, you know, <laughs> that leads to one of my questions because, you know, I've been doing my radio show here for over 10 years. And, you know, Warrior has this reputation. A lot of the guys have come on the show and they haven't had good things to say about him. And you seem, you know, for, from over the years, you seem like a pretty straight up dude. And, uh, you know, you worked with him. You trained with him uh, when he was coming back to the ring. What was the impression that he left on you? You know, I can only speak firsthand, and we got along really well. I'm not sure uh, if that means that, uh, that I'm a nut, too, but, you know, <laughs> most of my friends are crazy. I can't believe I'm the only one that's not. Um, I totally expected to have some warrior moments. <laughs> I had uh, picked him up from the airport. We shot some RVD TV with Chris Nowinski, and I we went to the wrestling uh, gym and, and worked out. And the entire time, he was nothing but respectful. And at the end of the day, he said, you know what, Rob? He said, I just really feel like we connected. He goes, I'm going to put, uh, I'm gonna put a, a, a banner up on my website that says to go to your website. Like, I've never done that for anybody in 10 years. I'm going to do that for you. And I don't know if he did that or not, yeah. but I was just like, wow, man, that was, that was like really cool. And um, I had a total different experience with him than, than a lot of people will. That's awesome. And an another name that you brought up, uh, I have some people in the chat room asking me to ask you about Chris Masters, if you've heard anything about him uh, coming back to the WWE. Yeah, I mean, at this point, there's no uh, official word. He, it's best, best as I understand, I don't think he's uh, officially signed anything yet, you know, so... Um, you know, so there's really no no word there, but I, you know, he's uh, he's ready. He's in great shape, and uh, he's he's off the stuff that got him in trouble last time, uh, and he's really motivated. And now he's got more experience because he's been doing the indie scene. Guys just skip the indie scene and go straight from rest of the school to the big time, and they're still uh, on the job training. You know, learning uh, while everyone's working around them. They don't really understand uh, a lot of the uh, intimate connection you have working the indie shows, and that gives you a lot of control, uh, and you need that for your foundation. You know? yeah. So he's definitely more well-rounded now. We'll see what happens. Yeah, what, uh, what are your memories on uh, the late Misawa? I mean, you, you spent a great deal of your time earlier in your career in All Japan. Masawa was the only cool Japanese veteran to us Americans. Uh, when I started wrestling in all Japan in 93, uh, Kawada and uh, all the other guys, they were all like real jerks to us. And that's part of their culture, you know, that's what they do. We're, especially me, I was a young boy, and some of the other guys that were young boys, you know, they, they kind of, they, they, looked, they looked down on us, and they made it well known that they looked down on us. They wouldn't talk to us, you know, they kind of like snarl at us. Yeah. But Sawa was the only one that was cool. Uh, as over as he was, like, top guy. I mean, the crowd would go nuts when he would come out. 
he was still humble enough. He would even come to our dressing room uh, to talk to us uh, on, the, on the American side sometimes, which the other Japanese guys never, never. Wow. Now once they reach a certain uh, stage, you know, the young boys would come over and also... If mixed martial arts would have been around, there's no <laughs> doubt you couldn't have stopped me from it. Because I was hungry then, I had that drive, and I always wanted to challenge myself and test myself. So uh, when I went to wrestling school, I was also competing in the uh, Tough Man contest. And, uh, and I thought that maybe I could go either way, because in, in practicing kickboxing and sparring, I knocked all my friends out. <laughs> you know, something that I was really good at. So I thought, you know, it'd be something exciting to do. I mean, you're a kid trying to figure out your future. But wrestling really took off for me. Um, now I train mixed martial arts, uh, mostly with Justin McCauley because he's one of my best friends. And, um, I, you know, I, I admire that. Like, to get in the ring and throw it all and risk it all out there, um, it would really have to be a numbers issue. It has to be some big money because I don't have that. Uh, I don't have that determination or, or that hunger to do that inside of me. I'm extremely happy uh, with my life, way more happy than probably any wrestler you have on your show with my own life. The proof is I have a wide open door at WWE, I have a wide open door at TNA, um, and I keep those doors open, but I don't want to walk through them because I enjoy my home life so much, so yeah. much. Most of the guys... They bitch and complain about being on the road. They say they miss home, but really, they want to be on the road. That's why they're there. I mean, yeah. everything that we do is by personal choice. I hear people all the time say, oh, I want to quit smoking, but I just can't. I don't believe that. I think every time you light up a cigarette, it's your choice. You're lighting up because you want to smoke. If you admit it that you want to smoke, that's so much better than having that unnecessary inner struggle where you've got yourself convinced, you know, I'm addicted, so it's okay. Yeah. People use the word addiction for everything in this society. And on a, on a mental, uh, psychological note, I don't believe it. Yeah. I think there's no greater machine than the power of the mind. You know, physical addiction, I get a chemical imbalance. I can understand that. But mentally, you can overcome anything you want to do, and you can create the, the universe uh, and, and have everything manifest right from your own brain. It's, it's living in a magical life, you know. So I do, um, uh, I do have an exciting path that I'm on, and I have some insight as to what I'm going to be doing in the, in the near future. Uh, MMA is not part of it, but I have a lot of projects that uh, I'm extremely happy with. This is, this is how I know that I'm going to live a long time. I don't know how to not be busy. I've got so many projects on the table always. Yeah. Uh, I have, I have a, um, a fan in the chat room from Italy that uh, wants to know if you're going to write a book in the future. Yeah, I will definitely write a book in the future, hopefully uh, several books, not just the autobiography of my life, uh, but I also have some other nonfiction ideas of some storytelling that I'd like to do as well. That's, uh, that's one of those many things that I want to do that, that, ta that takes time. You know, yeah. um, Somehow I'm always, always busy, and when it comes time to write my book, I will have to set aside you know, a portion uh, of my life, I may have to go somewhere, lock myself up somewhere, um, you know, something like that to actually get the book out. It's nothing that, that I can really just chip away. Although I do take notes, write down notes and stuff like that. I have a lot of writing projects. Uh, uh, way before you'll see that, you'll see, uh, you'll see my chemical project, which is, uh, um, which is almost, uh, which is nearing finished right now that uh, um, I'll be promoting. Uh, not too far into the, into the future. Awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, I, I remember back, uh, I think you were Shawn Michaels' second or, or third opponent after he uh, made the comeback and uh, came back into wrestling. Uh, what are your memories of uh, wrestling Shawn Michaels? Um, the match itself doesn't stick out uh, as a standout match. You know, it wasn't something that, uh, that I remember being, like, uh, really great. I think it was at Madison Square Garden. And um, really, I was kind of over it before it even happened because so many people were, were like putting so much on it. Yeah. They were like they were just throwing so much into it as far as uh, trying to build it up, and I didn't understand why because uh, I hadn't been a fan for the business for a long time, uh, and being on the inside of the business, I wouldn't be a, a fan uh, of that guy from what I know of him anyway. Yeah. Everybody approached me all day from uh, Stephanie to Shano to, 
the agents, everybody, like, hey, are you excited about your match? <laughs> Dude, it's gonna be, is this like a dream match? And I was like, whose dream? <laughs> is there some misconception that everybody thinks I jerk off to thinking of wrestling uh, the Heartbreak Kid or something? Because I don't. And, and that's how I felt going into it. I was like, look, I've already been here for, uh, I don't know, four or five years at that point. I have a good match with everybody always. Here this guy is trying to come back from a back injury the way I felt from a business perspective because it was business, was that, hey, if this match is not perfect, it's going to be his fault. He's coming back questionable, in shape. You're wondering if he's in shape. And, and no, it's not a dream match. It's not exciting. It's me going to work. I was really already burned out at that time. I mean, I gave up uh, a lot of what I loved about the business when I signed into a contract with WWE. And the longer I was there, the more business-like it became and the more passion um, – Set aside. So it was mostly about, you know, uh, getting there, uh, doing the job, and, and moving on. I often felt slighted. Um, one example I'll give you, I remember this. A few years ago when uh, Bruce Pitchard, and uh, this is nothing uh, against Bruce. I said plenty against Bruce on other shows, but he's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's you know. But, uh, but anyway, he comes up to me one time, and he goes, uh, he says, hey, Rob. He goes, uh, John Cena's going to be gone. He's going to be filming this movie in October. I'm like, okay. He goes, well, this is like where we need you to step up. I said, what are you talking about? He said, well, I mean, you know, this, we want you to go, go up, you know, and move it up a notch, you know, take that main event position. I said, so put me in the main event. You're the booker. Isn't that your job? <laughs> That's the way that I looked at it. That's the way I looked at it. I'm like, I've been here six years working my ass off. If you guys don't see in me what it takes to, to put me in the main event, that's on you and how you handle your investment. And that's totally how I felt. That's how I felt the whole way I was there. A lot of fans know that about me, and they respect my integrity. At the same time, maybe you need to be a little more uh, flexible on your morals or something to get further ahead. I don't know. I certainly never thought that I would uh, make it to the top and be champ. That's only... That's only because I changed the whole playing field to make it happen. <laughs> Speaking of, of that night, I mean, for fans that were in the building at One Night Stand, I mean, I, I've had fans call into my radio show, and, you know, they talk about it as if, you know, my grandfather would talk about seeing Babe Ruth hitting a home run. Um, you know, were you, were you able, you know, what are your memories of just the connection that you had that night with the fans? Yeah, it, was, it was incredible. Uh, one one-of-a-kind experience, literally, because everything that made that unique could not be duplicated. It couldn't be repeated. All the energy uh, of the original ECW spirit in gratitude for the return, everybody uh, hating everything that John Cena stands for <laughs> and loving what I stood for on that night, it just could not happen again. Um, it, it couldn't be done any other, other way, so... Uh, definitely the highlight uh, of my career that, uh, that um, uh, I like to think about with the energy and the connection uh, from the fans. It was, uh, it was just it was amazing. And also, I kind of felt, you know, like I was able to, uh, uh, to do what I like to do and, and, and what I love, you know, and perform as an artist the way, uh, the way that I felt that I and my like-minded fans appreciate because uh, prior to that, it's always about compromising and just doing what you can do to, to mix and match, you know, with this guy, with this style, with these perimeters. This was about, okay, Rob, well, show us, you know, what it is about ECW that you love. So, hell yeah, I will. The crowning moment, you know, uh, definitely of my career when I, when I got the belt. And at that moment, I had a lot of hope because I thought we were bringing back the third brand as, the ECW as I knew it. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you still do uh, RVD radio? I do. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll be doing it in a little over an hour at uh, blogtalkradio.com slash RVD radio. It's something that uh, I just do uh, for the hell of it. You know, um, that I, I like I like to uh, be in radio stations. I like to be in the studio, especially when I take phone calls. Uh, I've always liked that about doing media days with the WWE and, and promotions. And I always knew that someday when I'm ready to settle down to a regular schedule, that's something I could do. You know, if I'm, uh, uh, if I'm in a town and I want to go to work every morning or something, <laughs> I could get a job at a radio station doing talk shows because yeah. I, don't, I don't know much about music. 
um, topical shows. That's my thing. And I would love to have, you know, a budget and have, you know, a couple of, like, co-hosts and uh, actually reach out to thousands of people. But what I have with RVD Radio is uh, they approached me and said, look, uh, if you want to do this, you can do it from home. You can do it anytime you want. Talk about whatever you want. It can be as long as you want. Uh, you can stop whenever you want and quit doing it. So I was like, okay, why not? So I've been doing it for a little while. Uh, we, we always have fun with it. Sonia's always here beside me reading the chat room and laughing and having a good time while I'm uh, babbling like I, like I am <laughs> now. Um, you know, there's a little bit of pressure because I have to book a couple of guests to be on it. You know, and I usually don't do that until the night before or sometimes the day of. Yeah. Uh, like this, uh, I booked him for tonight's show before I asked him, and then I, I just heard from him, and he said he's with the girlfriend. He can't do it tonight. My bad. False <laughs> advertisement by RVD. I don't think anybody really cares, but just to let you know how loosely formatted the show is. Yeah. Uh, there you go. So we're doing RVD radio tonight, and uh, there, there's like no big money in that or anything. It's just something that's uh, kind of fun. We have had some amazingly good shows too. Unfortunately, the last show we did on uh, marijuana and our economy did not get recorded. Most of the people will go listen to the archives as opposed to listening live. Yeah. There was technical difficulties at Blog Talk Radio, and it sucked because we had Bruce Merkin on the Marijuana Policy Project, explaining it to us, telling us how, how it is, and uh, and the show did not get recorded. So I'm pretty bummed about that, but then again, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've had it happen. I had, I had a phenomenal interview with Kevin Von Erich uh, once on here that did not get recorded, so you'll have to do what I did. I just had him back two weeks later and did it all over again so we could record it. Yeah, you know what? I'll, I'll definitely want to do another topic on the marijuana sometime in the near future because... And I appreciate you uh, letting me talk for a while on your show about it, too, because uh, I do not want to see California uh, declare bankruptcy, and I do want to educate people and let them know that mostly everything that they've heard about marijuana is probably lies. Yeah. It probably is. Um, it's important that I do my part, you know, to reach out and, and, and let people know the truth. I mean, uh, you hear some of the facts that I'm telling you, that, that's all I want. I don't, you know, people should know nobody's ever died from it. It's, very, it's safe and non-toxic, yet it was outlawed for, being, uh, for causing violence, promiscuity, and eventually insanity. <laughs> people know that it's lies. They don't care enough to change it, but that's okay, uh, you know, as long as they're getting softer on it, because it's something like masturbating. Like, people do it, but they don't want to talk about it. Right. Right. They don't think they think it's dirty, like it's not something you throw out on a table for discussion. Well, no, here in California, it's very common. In fact, in the country, that like 46% of adults have admitted to trying marijuana, you know, including our last four presidents, for sure. So, yeah, the perception is changing, and uh, I'm doing my part, and appreciate you guys letting me speak for a minute on your show about it as well. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to have you on. Um, you know, over the years... Uh, you know, I do um, on, on NFL Draft Day, I would always do these fantasy drafts. And two years in a row, you were picked as the number one draft by the fans, out, number one pick as the, by the fans out there. So, you know, I mean, you have a lot of fans that listen to the show. And, uh, you know, I sat down with you about 13 years ago for, uh, for that shoot interview. And people still come up to me to this day and quote you from the shoot interview and say, I'm no psychic. Nice. <laughs> we missed out on making a T-shirt for that one, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to keep you um, because I know you got your show to go to. But uh, you know, I would love to have you back, especially you know when you have the the comic project uh, ready to go or or any time. You always have a a place here to go. And I know I talked to Kevin uh, about maybe doing a simulcast at some point, and that'd be awesome too. And you know, it's just uh, a real pleasure having you on the show here. Yeah, well, right okay, well, I appreciate it, and uh, you guys, uh, yeah, you guys have a great day. Remember, everybody can always keep up with everything I'm doing, and I'm always doing a lot more than I'm talking about, uh, but robbandam.com uh, is the place to go. You can uh, follow my Twitter, which uh, I do, I Twitter. Do you guys Twitter, or do you guys think that's stupid? Uh, b barely. I barely do it. Here's the key, though, because people say, uh, hey, what's your Twitter account? Hey, I'll follow you. You follow me. Yeah. I have, uh, last time I checked, I had like uh, 2,500 and still followers. Guess, uh, guess how many I follow? How many? Zero. <laughs> me too, man. I don't want to know if they're walking the dog or going to the grocery store. You know, I got big stuff going on. I, I Twitter where it's like, dude, I just kicked John Rule's ass on the movie set. 
I mean, I'm just, you know, giving the message out. I'll probably Twitter and all the things and let people know that uh, IVC Radio is on live tonight. And uh, you can get to Twitter info. It's Twitter at the real IVC. And uh, all that stuff is always at LiveFandam.com. And, yeah, join RVD TV. Join because it's cheap. Uh, join to get the free DVD. And then stay because it's awesome and it's cheap. Or cancel if you don't, you know, whatever. But uh, it's all good. Yeah, it's all definitely. Good RVD, I... And even when you're an RVD fan. Yeah, definitely. I already have an ad. I've had an ad for your DVD up on my website for a while now, so you know, uh, fans can you know go there through Amazon, your website, and I'll also get in touch uh, with Kevin because I'd love to throw a banner or something uh, of your website up on my site. I'd love to do that for you, dude. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And this DVD that we're pushing, it's got uh, it's got Warrior, Chris Oresky, Peter Bischoff, Chris Oresky, uh, Bruce Jacobs, Guy Williams, those guys are comedians. It's got movie producer Dave Pelka. Bunch of people and uh, taboo from Black Eyed Peas. It's uh, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, I live in California. I know a lot of people, <laughs> and uh, I like shoving a camera in their face. That's awesome, man. Hey, best of luck with everything. Have a good show tonight, and uh, you know, I mean, I, I can't congratulate you enough. Uh, you know, for for you and your wife and beating cancer. I mean, that's that's really the ultimate right there. Thanks, man. I look forward to doing the show again in the near future. Definitely. Thanks again, Rob. Take care. Have a great night. Yeah, you too, buddy. All right, that was...